This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. Seeing as we have a quorum of the town council present, uh, we are calling the special meeting of the town council to order at 501. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, all th 13 councilors are present for this meeting, having joined remotely. We have called this meeting as a special town council meeting, and therefore, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Future meetings will have clear ways to offer public comment. That information will be posted on the town's website as we figure it all out. Meantime, we continue to urge you to contract, contact the town council either individually or by email, towncouncil at amherstma.gov. As a preface to our presentations and discussion tonight, the Town Council recognizes that this is a new reality. We ask our residents to brace themselves for the changes that are coming and have already arrived. We will all need to work as a community, neighbors helping neighbors and the community working to help those who may struggle due to the imposition of disease, lack of resources, and losing a job. Our elders are more vulnerable and our children are bewildered. The town of Amherst is very fortunate to have the outstanding leadership of our town manager, Paul Bachman, assistant town manager, Dave Zomack, and our talented and dedicated staff as we anticipate the unknown. In addition, the town's public health leaders and emergency response team are here this evening. Health director, Julie Fetterman, uh, fire and EMS chief, Tim Nelson, Police Chief Scott Livingstone, and Department of Public Works Superintendent Guilford Mooring. They are part of this coordinated effort. As Julie has recently said, we've been preparing for this event, an event of this enormity for 17 years, ever since 9-11. We urge all to regularly visit the town's website, amherstma.gov dash three slash, excuse me, 3519 slash coronavirus for more details and continual updates. And we ask for everyone's patience as other important business of the town may be appropriately delayed. With that, we're going to begin our meeting and a presentation will begin um, according to our agen agenda for by Paul Bachelman. So there should be something on your screen if you can see it. Uh, this shows a slide presentation. I hope the counselors can see it. Can you nod or not nod? Not yet. It's showing up. We're pulling it up. <laughs> so it seems like a long time ago, but it's been less than a week since I reported to the town council last Monday about the status of our preparations for COVID-19. At that point, we were talking about potentially uh, travel bans to other states, um, some minor changes to our operations, uh, nothing of the magnitude that we are um, talking about today. Um, are we there yet? Oh, can, can folks see the slideshow? Okay. So, so this is a dynamic, ever-changing situation. Um, the town has been nimble. We've taken actions we had prepared for, and some of them much sooner than we ever, ever anticipated. Um, some, we plan, we adjust, we execute, execute. It's a real team effort, and it's not surprising because we have a terrific team. It's just this morning, uh, the superintendent of public works, Guilford Mooring, and the assistant superintendent, Amy Rizeki, and the health director, Julie Fetterman, and I met with the members of our wastewater treatment plant. And 
they had concerns. They are frontline employees. If their operations don't continue, we have real problems in the town. They had legitimate concerns, but um, and Julie was able to answer them when she could and acknowledged if she couldn't. Uh, these are employees who are um, on the front lines every day, and we have to make sure that they maintain their health. For our town, we're managing a very major transition in how we conduct business. Um, for the cert we're going to be looking at our hours of operations, how we, how we prepare, how we test. Um, and as you can see tonight, we really want to give credit to our IT department for all the work that they've done um, to get this meeting up and running, to get this technology into all of your uh, laptops so you could participate today. So the first thing we wanted to talk about is now joining. Oh, thank you. Um, so the first thing we wanted to talk about is what is coronavirus and why do we care about it? And our health director, Julie Fetterman, is going to talk about that. Oh, well, first off, I'm going to, let's go to the next. So some actions that have happened already. So we had the, the governor declared a state of emergency on March 12th. Uh, we closed the town's public buildings to all outside groups that, on March 12th. Um, we closed the town buildings to the public starting today, March 16th. The Amherst Regional Public Schools are closed as of today. The governor closed restaurant and bars. He announced this on Sunday. That is effective tomorrow, March 17th. Our higher education institutions uh, have transitioned to online learning, all three of them. And higher education campuses are primarily closed to the public. Next slide. So these are the things we want to cover tonight. We're going to give you a status report on, on where we are. We're going to address some key questions and answers and talk about the preparations and plans where we are. And then I think that the counselors will have many questions and we're really eager to hear what those are. So next slide. So Julie is going to talk a little bit about COVID-19. Good evening. I just had the... Um, opportunity to get off the first federally um, federal, fed, nationwide conference call with the Centers for Disease Control. There are about a thousand of us on the call. And so what we've just learned is that CDC will be updating us this afternoon that there are currently in the U.S. 3,000 cases. They're calling this the acceleration phase. And the acceleration phase is directly impacted by the public health response. So you're all familiar with the curve and the concept of flattening the curve. So the acceleration phase is when we're seeing in the US enough cases that we are accelerating basically overnight. 700 cases were diagnosed overnight since last night. In Massachusetts, we have 45 confirmed cases and 119 presumptive positive cases. In Amherst, at this time, we have no confirmed cases. I wanna talk a little bit about transmission because I think this is one of the key things for people to understand. You've heard so much in the news, people are getting information in, on, from so many places, but I do wanna emphasize some of the key points. So one is that this is a novel virus, and what that means is it's a new virus. That's one of the reasons why it's so transmissible. People do not have immunity to it, so it spreads very easily, very quickly. Unlike flu, where many people over the years are building up a certain amount of immunity. Diseases are transmitted in various ways. This is a virus, which means that it's not living, unlike a bacteria, which is actually alive. This virus is sp spread via droplets. These droplets are big and heavy. They don't linger in the air. They are actually spewed out when you cough or sneeze and they land, hopefully not in your face, but they could land on, on you or on a surface. So that's why we keep talking about cover your cough, cover your sneeze, don't go anywhere sick, and wash your hands. Want to talk a little bit about washing your hands? 
Soap and water is what you want to use to wash your hands. Again, I know it seems so boring, but I was actually reading some studies about soap and water last night. Washing your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds vastly reduces virus and also bacteria at the same time on your hands. The reason that's critical is, though, is because even though you are keeping your surfaces clean, you may go into another room or into some place where a surface is not clean, and even though you've just washed your hands, you're now touching that surface. So that's why repeatedly washing your hands is important and also not touching your face. Because when you touch a surface and then touch your face, you're coming close to mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. This is a lower respiratory illness. And one of the things we know is that the receptors for this virus are mostly located in your nose and in your lungs. And that's why the disease so easily can get from your face down into your lungs. You're hearing a lot about hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is not necessary except in places where there's no access to soap and water. So it's not necessary for you to have hand sanitizer in your house. The best thing for you to do is to wash your hands with soap and water, and that's true anywhere else that you go. If you're not in your own bathroom, then if you're somewhere else, you're going to use a paper towel or something to turn off the faucet. Many of these are health behaviors, or actually these are all health behaviors that we should always be using, even at other times. So. The main tool we have other than personal hygiene for containing the spread of this disease is variations of social distancing. So right now, even though you can't see us in town hall, we're all sitting six feet away from each other. That is the initial type of social distance, distancing that we're looking at. One of the reasons for that is when you sneeze or cough, what is ejected from your body is not going to go more than six feet. So this is a, a, a mechanical, blunt barrier to spreading disease. You've also heard the words quarantine and isolation. Quarantine is an especially uncomfortable word. It sounds rather scary. But what it really means is that someone who's not sick but has been in contact possibly with someone who is ill or has traveled somewhere with high rates of transmission is going to stay at home for 14 days and isolate themselves in their room. They're not going to share bedding. They're not going to share a bathroom. So that during that 14 days, which is the incubation period of the disease, in the event that they began to develop, develop disease, which tends to happen between days three and we're looking at maybe three and seven, though it can happen anywhere in those 14 days, that that person would already have stayed home and not had contact with anyone. At the end of those 14 days, if a person has had no symptoms, they're absolutely fine. They go back to work. They can have full contact with any, anyone that they want. Isolation is the tool we use when someone is actively sick with the disease. Now, one of the things you're hearing about is the availability of testing. So in a perfect world, someone would get tested they would stay home, and within two days, they would find out whether they had a positive test. If they had a positive test, that test would be repeated. They would be assumed a case. They would stay home for one week minimum, seven days minimum. And after that, only after three days of having no fever and not using any type of fever reducer and not having any symptoms, would they then be allowed to leave their home. The problem we're having right now is that the tests are so limited, as you've heard, that only two categories of people in Massachusetts are being able to be tested regularly. It's those who are at increased risk for severe illness and healthcare and critical infrastructure workforces. Those are the people who are being tested. Their tests are being sent to the state lab. As we speak, other labs are being opened up to be able to process tests. This is a dynamic situation. The testing will be changing day by day. So right now, what we have learned actually today is that 
people who have not been tested but are getting a clinical diagnosis from their providers of having COVID-19 are also being told to stay home and isolate. You will occasionally hear people confusing the two words of quarantine and isolate. It's important to remember that when you're hearing that someone is quarantined at home, that person does not have active case, an active case of disease. It's actually just that extra barrier to, present, to, to prevent transmission. As you know, there is no vaccine at this time. To developing vaccines takes a long time. We're not looking at having a vaccine until probably a year from now. Here you have a picture of uh, the, the wave and the curve. When I, when I got off the, um, what we want to see is a flattening there. You see with protective measures, public health measures, we hope to decrease that acceleration of cases that we're seeing now. One of the reasons to do that is to not overwhelm our healthcare and hospital systems. But the other reason is that if we slow that acceleration, we should also see a decrease in the total of cases. You want me? This is the time to really take serious measures. If we do this now, we can slow the spread it's important for everyone to comply with whatever is being presented to them. It's very difficult for us to change our habits, but each person's ability to do that is what is really going to help to slow the spread of this disease. And when you're slowing the disease, you're protecting not only yourself, but those in your family, your neighborhood, or your community who are at highest risk, those with diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac and respiratory illness, older folks, especially those over 80, and very young children and infants. So I, we put in a couple quotes from Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is, you know, in my mind, the foremost expert and has gone through this before and, has, and really is a leader on this. And he has sounded the alarm in essence that the, t the cities and towns and states and federal government should be acting sooner than later. So you have seen in the last week a wave of actions by the federal government, by the state governments, and by local governments to try to counteract the development of, in the spread of this virus. It's a, it's a virus that spreads very easily and there is a lot that's not known about it. And that's one of the things that um, Julie is really good at is she, she has been meeting with town employees and other groups um, regularly for the last two weeks and able to answer all the questions that they have. And I'm sure you all have questions that you're, are pent up. So I'd ask you to just write those down. You don't have to chat them, but just write them down because we're going to come back at the end for questions and answers. Now I want to just sort of run through where we are as a town, which is where what we are concerned about. The way I look at it is we can only control what we can control. And all the policies at the federal and all the decisions at the state, we can't really control. But we can control our operations. So we have looked, I've, we have looked at this as sort of a two legs. One leg, you have the public health system, and the other leg is your public safety system. So on the public health system, it flows from the CDC to the State Department of Public Health to the local uh, Board, of Public Health, Board of Health or our health director. On the public safety side, it flows from FEMA to MEMA to our local emergency management director, who is our, also our fire chief, Tim Nelson. So it's on these two legs that we stand and that we have addressed this. So Tim and Julie are, are two subject matter experts on this. They have mobilized both the public health field and the public safety field in the response. So, so our core emergency team uh, is Julie, who's our health director, Tim Nelson, who's our fire chief and EMS and director and emergency management director, uh, Scott Livingstone, who is our police chief, and he's also in charge of dispatch, which is a critical link to anybody who has a concern, they dial 911. Um, and our dispatch center is really well trained on this. However, you know, it's a small space and we worry about their, their, their health as well. 
Dave Zomek is the assistant town manager. He's our public information officer and has been working with our outside constituent groups and with town staff extensively. Guilford Mooring is our superintendent of public works. And a lot of times people say, why public works? This is public health. Public works is critical to our operations because there are a few systems that we are required that we must have, and that's electricity, it's water, and it's wastewater. And some people now would say internet, um, but if our water systems and wastewater systems go down, uh, that's a real problem for the public health of the town plus the public convenience of the town, and Guilford will talk about that in a little bit. Also, Sonia Aldridge, who's our interim finance director, and every, all the decisions we make all the purchases, purchases we make, the budgets, those are still realities that we have that we have to pay attention to. Our team doesn't act alone. We have people who support us. So on the communications front, we have Brianna Sunred, who's our communications manager. Uh, under uh, Guilford is Amy Rosecki, who's our assistant superintendent of public works and also one of the leaders in the state on water supply issues. Uh, Jen Brown is uh, our public health nurse who works with Julie and is a, has a fabulous way of interacting and educating people on this, on this um, virus. Holly Bowser is our assistant comptroller. She works Plus with Sonia. Plus one, four, one, three, two, three, seven, two, four, three, three. Is now exiting. Okay. But goodbye. Um, how, so all these things, uh, we have to go through our finance uh, system or our purchasing system. Angela Mills in the town manager's office is obviously central to everything that I do. Uh, in the fire department, we have our assistant chiefs, Jeff Olmsted and Lindsey Stromgren, and our police captains, Ron Young and Gabe Ting, all very strong, very experienced people, and we've even experienced it in this situation where someone couldn't be part of our team and the next person st stepped up and filled in admirably. So we think about a number of things as we plan for this, and we have been at this for several, a long time now, several weeks. I mean, Julie's been at this since January 20th, I think was the first, first real diagnosis, and Tim, obviously. So we think about force protection, and that sounds really like powerful, but what it means is you can't have first responders respond if the first responders are sick or disabled or something. So we have to make sure that the people that the town employees who are in the front lines are able, that are able to do the jobs and that they're protected. So this is called force protection. Police and fire have been at this for a long time. They have established protocols in place to help make sure that their teams are, are resilient and can respond and have all the protocols in place. And that's just where I talked a little bit about the dispatch. Uh, we have to make sure that they're all having best practices on hygiene so that there's no spreading of, uh, of the virus there. We weren't so good on the town side, honestly. We've really ramped up our systems, but in, we've had pretty um, strong uh, um, inter interventions that we've done, and that includes basically just closing our buildings. Um, Jones Library and its branches are closed, the schools are closed, and the town buildings are closed. This is part uh, of preventing people from gathering, too many people from gathering, Schools have a whole different metric for making their decision, but it's also to make sure that Unknown our- Unknown participant is now joining. This is so that our um, employees can do the jobs. And our, our employees um, need to do the job, especially in finance, for instance, that uh, they need to be able to get paychecks out. People worry about their mortgages. Are they gonna be paid? Are vendors gonna be paid on time? So that, because everybody's on very thin margins right now because of the, the impact on the econo economy. So all these things have to be still working in place. I mentioned our wastewater treatment plant operators this morning, also our water, treat, water treatment plant operators. These are all people who are central to the functioning of town government. This, so we have force command, and then the second thing is if force um, protection, and then the second thing is incident command. So if something happens, who's involved in that? Again, very strong team with Tim Nelson, Julie Fetterman, and Scott Livingstone, all able, and they're high communicators, they all have incredible um, experience with the town. And um, so if the, there are protocols in place for, you know, if someone calls in, dispatch has been trained to do a series of uh, questions that Scott can address, and so they're able to do that, to respond in an efficient way. 
The next thing we look at, so we, we have um, force protection, um, and then we go to continuity of operations. So continuity of operations, COOP, so they, sometimes they call it, it's like how are you going to keep your operations moving when um, all these things are doing? So we have a team that includes Dave Zomack, uh, Sean Hannon from IT, HR Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg, DPW Amy Rzecki, and finance with Sonia Aldridge. And these are the folks who are working on, and they've been working for several weeks now on workforce protection, which is why we closed our, some of our buildings. If people are required to work at home or with the schools being closed, more and more people have to do that, take that option. What are the rules about working remotely? How are, how are they able to, to reach connectivity? Are they able to have the files? So IT has been working overtime on that. If people aren't able to come in, what's our policy on time off and compensation for that? And uh, policies on all kinds of things that, that HR is working through. And then the other thing is because of this disease, we can't have in-person meetings, which is why we're conducting this meeting this way. And so we have to um, in, implement and share out and train on virtual meeting technology with this system that we're using today. So there's, there are a lot of pieces in play. People have been working seven days a week, literally seven days a week to, to make all this happen. And so it's been really a, a terrific uh, team effort. So the next thing is about communications. It's all about communications. We have, um, you know, I look back, letter to employees, this was sort of a alert letter about a week ago and it seems so innocent now because we were alerting them to things that now seem so passe. Um, we've at, uh, had department heads meetings and that was the last time we had a meeting because the next day we, we realized we shouldn't be having meetings. Um, we've, um, we've, we have, um, then we started to have staff meetings, and if you could see this room, uh, on all the rooms in town hall, we put a new occupancy limit. The now every, build, every room in, in the building has a fire code occupancy permit limit, but now we have a new limit based on social distancing. And that for this room, it's 18 people are allowed in the town room. Previously, there'd be closer to 90 or 100 people who could fit in here. So, the, so there are new, th new things, and, and when we tried to have an all staff meeting, we realized not all staff should get together in one room. So we introduced new technology so we could have some people stay at their desks and participate remotely. And all these things are being run out and delivered within 24 hours. We say, oh my gosh, we gotta do this. IT jumps up and makes it happen somehow. Uh, we've been meeting, we had wastewater today. I think there was a, a highway or water meeting this afternoon. Again, 7 a.m. tomorrow, there's another meeting coming up that Julie or Jen go and meet with the employees and just talk to them, listen to, listen to their concerns, or try to address their, their concerns. Um, last week, we went to the, met with the library staff, again, at the, in the Woodbury room, but there were probably about 20 seats that were allowed in there, um, maybe 25. Um, so it, everyone was perfect, was socially distanced apart. So we've been working on lots of different levels, primarily to communicate with our employees because there's a lot of anxiety amongst our employees not knowing what this means. They're the public face of the town. They're interacting with the public on a regular basis. They're accepting um, paper and money from the public. And so there's lots of, um, just the unknown is what's, what's staggeringly uh, challenging. And, and it's truly an unknown because even the experts, you ask Julie about something and she'll say, nobody really knows the answer to that question because it is a novel virus. Sean. So as we were going through this, we looked at also what are the, what are the programs that were gonna be impacted? And so Dave worked with our LSSE and Barb Bills, the library and Sharon Sherry, our senior um, center director, Mary Beth Ogilevitz, and they started cataloging all of the programs that they had. And initially we were saying, which ones can we have and which ones can we, do we not? And so we do all the work on which ones we could do. And then quickly it's like, no, we can't do any of them. So we move forward. Um, so I wanna just go through with our team who's here today and talk about where we are from your perspectives. So we'll start with uh, Chief Nelson, who's our second subject matter expert. So you have to push it down and hold it, you have to hold it down. Oh, geez, okay, there we go. Good evening. 
Uh, just, just real, 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 real quick. We're in a good, good place in terms, in terms of public safe, 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 safety. I, I would say we've done a lot, a lot of work, a lot, a lot of training, tra training in years past for some, some, something like, like this. Um, and you talked, you talked about the team. Uh, th this team has been work, work, working, as Paul, Paul said, for, for weeks. Interesting. A quick note: um, I was in uh, Washington State back in Jan, Jan, January when the when the first case came came out. It was in a couple of towns over from from where where where, where I was, and I called uh, <laughs> Julie, where I sent the center of Texas, said, "Hey, something's going to go 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 going on on here, and so 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 on and so so forth." So we we we've, we've begun to work work on this week weeks ago. And it just it just goes 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 to show that you know we've got a, a real really good team team here 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 in town. Um, a couple just just three three quick quick things. I think one folks should, should be re, 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 reassured that the town is doing all that 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 it can to address this and address the needs of of, of our res, res, residents. Um, you know, we we still we you know we still still have power, power. We still have water. We still have have a sewer. You still 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 have police out out on 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 the streets. You still have have us re responding to emergencies. But we're also doing a lot lot more to address this public public health emergency. Um, and another 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 thing would be you know just. Listen, listen to the science. The science, the science. Julie, Julie, the Federman just went went through a lot, a lot of that, and we need to listen to that and pay attention, 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 attention to that because that is that's a big part part of what is going to get get us through 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 this. Without any any hysteria or or anything like 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 that. Um, and third, you know, use we need need a. a to take our kind of common sense approach, approach to this, this too. We talked about how you know uh, folks are at times making runs on supermarkets and all all that. Do we really need 30 days worth of provisions for 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 this? No, no, you you don't. And the other the other part part of this is if if we do do things like 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 that. It, it, it can hurt your neighbor. And this is one... Unknown one. participant is now exiting. See ya. Uh, <laughs> uh, was this something, this something I said? Uh, but this is, this is one, one of those times where we really need, need to come, come, come together. So some, someone said the last, the last time we, we, were like, like we, we were in a situation like, like this was 9-11. Nine, 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 uh, and I, I, I even say that this is akin, akin to that. It, but it's going to affect a lot more pe people. But if we do the right right thing, if we're smart, it means we're not going to hurt our neighbor. Our neighbor. Uh, as as you know, uh, so the supermarkets are reducing their hours. That's so they have a chance to clean. You know, we're, we're really clean, clean their facilities. But at the same same time, it gives them time to restock. So we so that we'll have the goods and services that we we need. We need to give them a chance to do to do that. This is going to be a community effort, and it's going to go on for a little while. But we're going to get get through through this. And, and again, I can't. I guess I can't em, 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 emphasize enough that. First and foremost, we need to take care of each Unknown other. Unknown participant is now joining. We need to take care of each other, and that's what uh, the town town team 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 is, do, is doing, and that's what we will continue to continue to continue to do. Uh, talking about our our uh, our operations. Uh, as I said, we're we're, we're going to continue to continue to answer, answer the call. We've uh, we've we've trained. We've uh, we've enhanced our Paul 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 policies a bit to uh, to direct, directly address 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 it, this public health emergency. Part part of what 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 we do is support the health the health health department part, 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 part in their in their their work and react react to those 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 needs that come up because 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 of this. 
So our folks, folks are trained. Uh, we've got we got the protective equipment that 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 we need. We're working with our par, 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 par partners as well, and that, and that includes uh, Cooley Dick and Bay Bay and Bay Bay Bay, Bay State Medical Center. And on a, on a large 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 note, we're work, working with our, our our three centers of high, 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 higher higher ed as 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 well, because we're all par, partners in 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 this, in protective detecting our community. community. Thank you. So, Scott, you want to talk about police and dispatch and how you're prepared and how this differs from what you're normally dealing with? Sure. Um, so, currently, both the dispatch centers are ready. I have to hold it. No, I got it. So, no, currently, uh, uh, both the police and dispatch center, first of all, everybody's healthy. We have, you know, 100% of our officers and dispatchers. Uh, are working, uh, no sick in calls. So we're in a good place there. You know, officers are continuing to be on their proactive patrols uh, as routinely as they always would be. Um, we are responding to calls as normal. Um, we have made some tweaks to the types of calls that we may change and made adjustments to, and some of those are like medical calls in the nature, some of those uh, types of calls and some of our quality of life calls. We've got contingency plans in place where we may not want officers waiting into large crowds, that sort of thing. So we've made changes there, uh, anticipating uh, perhaps when the students return. But, you know, we're trying to stay as normal as possible when it call, become, comes to um, call response and that sort of thing. We want our officers out on the streets being visible and being as routine as possible um, from that perspective. There is a um, message on our web page as well about Know, vehicle stops and there may be a reduction in that but um, again officers will be out there they'll be vigilant um, and, and responding to calls and doing what police officers do in the dispatch center again uh, everybody's healthy there and everybody's reporting to work um, we have contingency plans if things if somebody were to become just sick over the normal course of uh, working because there are currently 10 full-time dispatchers there we're lucky in that we have four police officers on our department who have previous dispatch experience. So if somebody were to get ill, we have emergency officers who could fill in for them. So um, everything from on dispatch is, is normal as of now. Um, you know, our records bureau will be operating at full capacity, but um, probably through electronic uh, ability. So if people need records requests, we can still have the ability to do that but it'll be conducted electronically. Um, so we're in a good place there. Um, and last but not least, um, Carol Hepburn, <laughs> the animal control officer, she's going to continue to work. I'm trying to get her to, um, I'm, I'm working on getting her to understand the importance of social distancing and doing the right thing, but that's uh, per usual, you know, Carol kind of drives the ship, even though I'm in charge. So um, that's a work in progress, and I'll get back to you on how those are working. But, you know, all in all, public safety, police, and dispatch, we're in a really good place, and, um, you know, everybody's on board. Thank you. I mean, that was one of the things that uh, the public should rest assured is that police and fire especially have a lot of contingencies. They do a lot of contingency planning, um, worst-case scenario planning. Uh, what if there's a chemical spill? What if there's something happening at the university? Um, what if our dispatch center goes down? They have contingency plans and connections with the state police and can move things momentarily in, in an instant. So they have a lot of contingencies in place. Um, but it's still people who are responding to incidents. And so our, our work is only as good as we are able to keep our people healthy. And so that's why we talk about force uh, protection to make sure that all those folks are, are healthy. So, and then Guilford, do you want to talk about public works and water and sewer and all the divisions you have? So right now the water system is working perfectly the way it's supposed to. Um, we are coming to the spring season, so there's things we will be doing that we normally do every spring to help improve water quality in the system. You'll see our crews out flushing water lines, which is a normal thing. It has nothing to do with uh, the virus that's going on right now. Um, we will be doing normal sampling, so you will see crews that go out and will be going to businesses that we normally go to to do our sampling. We're required to do that by the state, and the state hasn't changed those rules. The facility is, is stocked with chemicals. We have probably a full supply, so we should last our normal 
normal uh, duration for treatment. We actually seeing a drop in water usage. Um, students left and the water dropped like it normally does. The question is, will it stay down or will it come back up and will students come back at the end of the spring break? Um, but we're ready for that as well. The one thing that we ask you to do is if you have any concerns about the water, please call the office. You may have to leave a message or you may have to send an email, but let us know. Um, when the water system changes, when we lose customers or gain customers, we often have changes in how the system works and that could cause some discoloration or it could cause some weird smells or it could cause something in the, in the system that may concern you. Please let us know about that. They're normal and we just need to know about it and see if there's something abnormal about it. But most of the time it's normal. The wastewater plant is functioning as normal as well. We have a full staff. Um, we have one person who's out sick. Uh, he doesn't know what he's out sick with, but it seems to be he, he's the guy who's caught the flu the most this year, so we think he has the flu again. Uh, he had flu A the first time. I think he's on flu B this time. Um, we're doing all the things we can there. You will see people out doing routine maintenance on the sewer lines, the big truck with the elephant hose on the front, the Vactor truck. will be out cleaning sewer lines. Um, we're doing that for two reasons. One, it's routine maintenance, and if we don't do it, we have backups. Um, the second one re reason we're doing it is with everyone cleaning everything and using flushable wipes, uh, we're afraid people will flush them. Uh, flushable wipes should never, ever be flushed down the toilet. Do not do that, please. We've been having a lot of problems with flushable wipes and things being sent down the toilet which are not meant to go down the toilet. So please help us out and help our crews out. Um, you will see probably more personal protective measures taken by the crews as they're out working, just wearing a fa full face shield instead of a partial face shield, or they might actually have glo more gloves on or a suit on to help pr protect them from splashes as they work. Um, that's just something that they're doing and they should be doing it anyhow. And this is, they're just taking a step up on their PPE, their personal protective equipment. Um, highway, highway will be out working and parks will be out working as well. Uh, we do have things we are required to do every spring and they'll be working on those things and then they're there to take over as we need to or in, step into the water and wastewater world if we need to as well. So we're carrying along and moving things right along. Yes, the transfer station is open. We have made some changes to the transfer station. We want you to think of the transfer station as another place you need to social distance. Be prepared when you go there. You want to be in and out. You don't want to have long conversations with your neighbors. That's not the place to socialize, even though it is a very social place most of the time. Uh, deposit your waste and please leave. Um, do, do not bring a lot of things that do not really need to be disposed of. Concentrate on the things that do not need to be in your house, which is like basically household trash. Get your household trash out. Uh, if you have leaves and brush from cleaning your yard, let it sit for a while. Bring it in a couple of weeks or a couple of months uh, when things calm down and we have time to take care of it a little more. So the staff is there, but we want to limit the Im impact or the interaction with the public as much as we can, but we still want to keep the service open. Great, thank you. Um, th the next one we were talking about is town operations. Dave, do you want to address some of these things? Uh, sure, thanks, Paul. Um, so I'm working with this great team, as Paul mentioned before, our HR director, our interim finance director, our IT director, and our assistant superintendent of public works. But I wanted to also put a plug in for those staff that we work with um, that you often don't see up here on the stage. We have a, we have a terrific uh, group of people um, uh, that work with us uh, within our departments, and they have just stepped up tremendously from planners, inspectors, uh, DPW employees in water and sewer, uh, and the list goes on and on in LSSE. I've, I've talked to almost every uh, department head today, and um, uh, to, to a person, everyone seems to be stepping up. Um, folks are really dedicated, very committed. They want to continue operations, but they also understand the, the, the seriousness of the situation. So. What we're doing, working with our team uh, in terms of continuity of operations, um, all department heads are working with staff on um, 
uh, contingency plans to wor re uh, work remotely from home. We're also looking at alternating shifts within departments. The key is we want to continue as best we can to serve the public, to serve our boards and committees uh, during this period, particularly from now until April 7th. And at that time, I'm sure that uh, Paul will make uh, decisions that are appropriate as we move to the next phase. So we're, we're going to be re uh, working remotely. Uh, the public can still call our offices um, and email with questions, with concerns about uh, uh, plans, about um, uh, filings, et cetera. The key for us is to identify essential staff and tasks. So we'll be, you know, from accounts, pay or, uh, accounts payable, payroll, uh, how do we conduct inspections? Um, how do we continue construction projects? We'll be working closely with Guilford and his engineering team, uh, whether it be uh, the golf park uh, renovation or uh, the multi-purpose path on uh, East uh, Hadley Road. We'll be working on those projects and how we can use uh, best practices, social distancing, to keep those outside projects going. Um, we've been doing outreach to boards and committees uh, to chair people. Um, Paul did make the decision to suspend uh, all public meetings except those of the town council at least through April 7th and uh, we'll work with Paul to reevaluate um, that, uh, that policy uh, as we approach April 7th. Um, so outreach are, uh, is also ongoing to applicants in the regulatory process. It's very important that we communicate with those applicants uh, to let them know what we're doing between now and April 7th and then beyond that. So my staff will be reaching out uh, to those people uh, who have uh, filed applications. We'll also be uh, establishing protocols um, regarding any communications with the university, with Amherst College, with Hampshire College, the bid in the chamber. We've been reaching out to, to uh, those partners out in our community um, because they are trying to plan for events and uh, other activities in our community. Um, we'll also be establishing communication links and groups uh, within functional areas so that uh, work can continue remotely as our staff uh, do what they do best, which is serve um, everyone in our community. We would ask for your patience. Um, IT has been terrific, as has been mentioned, um, but it's going to take us a little while, some days, to get some of these systems up and running. Uh, when in doubt, please give uh, the, a call to our staff, uh, whether it's in conservation and development, whether it's in accounting, uh, we will do the best we can. You may not get a person, but uh, please leave a message and we will get some of our staff to return messages and emails as promptly as we can. So I think I'll stop there for now, Paul. Okay, so uh, we're sort of jumping around a little bit, but that's okay. And so our community partners, Dave mentioned, the Chamber in the Business Improvement District, we've met with both groups. Uh, Dave met with the full board of the chamber. And uh, then we had a team meeting with the uh, Amherst College, Hampshire College, UMass, their senior leaders, and their emergency managers, just to make sure those sort of communication uh, lines are open. And it was very helpful for them to hear each other and us to hear what their plans are and how they're addressing this. I have to say that um, the communication with our schools and with our library, with Sharon Sherry at the library and Mike Morris at the schools have been su superb. Uh, they're, they're, they are really team players. We're sharing information, um, making decisions together, and I, I really appreciate the, the willingness that they have to work with the town and move forward as a, as an ent as a group. So it's been really important. Um, so one of the things I want to mention was our, you know, we're, we are a college town, uh, Amherst College, Hampshire College, and University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and uh, they have all moved to remote learning or uh, moving people off of their campus. That has a big impact on us, and uh, not only, uh, I can feel it, I felt it today, how sort of vacant the town felt, and it felt sort of sad to me. It wasn't, usually when the students leave in the summer, you're sort of, everybody's sort of elated, but now it just felt a little, scary and sad, so, um, but we, we'll manage through this. There, but there are some real implications to the town's operations, and um, especially on finances, and we, this is not a high priority for it, for us, but it is gonna be something that we will have to take into consideration, the council will have to take into consideration. We will have lower revenues for water and sewer because we have a lot fewer students who are gonna be here for several months. Um, 
we will have reduced parking revenue because there will be fewer people coming downtown because all the restaurants are closed or working, um, you know, giving box lunches and things like that. With the restaurants being closed, our meals tax will go down. So a lot of the revenues that we're used to receiving are going to be lower this year. It has a really, the, this, this disease is, has a ripple effect across the economy. And that's why we believe that we need to take very strong action to do as much as we can to, to mitigate it. Um, J Dave mentioned the committees and how we really appreciate the committees. Um, basically going on hiatus for a couple weeks, let us get our people um, situated in their new work environments. This is a huge adjustment for our employees who already are f um, feeling anxious at home because of their children. Um, now they're, we're asking them to work from home to support the committee successfully. Um, we ask our committee's members and uh, board members to give us some time. If we wait until uh, early April, most committees will miss one meeting. It's not the end of the world. We can, and it will give us the space we need uh, to make sure all the staff who need to support these committees are up and running. And we can provide you with the technology that will comply with the open meeting law and so the public can be, uh, see, uh, see everything that you are doing as a committee. Those, those, that commitment to um, being open and transparent to the public are, is very high in our town. Uh, we will be focused on, um, let me go to the next one. I think we did that. Oh, and the, the last, uh, the other thing is about communications I want to talk about. And, uh, you know, communications is probably the linchpin for our connection to the public and to you as counselors. So we will tr continue to work hard to be um, communicate everything that we can get out to you. And we have plans for doing even more communication to the public. Um, things that we had in mind last week, we're saying, oh, this would be a great idea. Let's do a 90-second Q&A with, with Julie. And then there is no time because there is something that's happening and we have to address it right then and there. So all of our plans get uh, set aside and we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Uh, within 24 hours, everything, you know, we have a nice plan set up and it gets, we run right through it. Um, one of our biggest things that we have focused on, and maybe Dave will, will want to talk a, bit, a little bit about this, is our vulnerable populations. We are a community that is a welcoming community. Our um, senior center uh, is, and this is a very vulnerable population, is the seniors, our social service providers, our, our guests at the homeless shelter, um, non-English speakers, immigrant communities, people who are in extended care, you know, it's our, where the, we have concentrations of seniors at the Arbors, Ann Whalen, Clark House, Applewood. We have connections with all of those through different ways, and we use existing connections. It might be through the fire department, it might be through the health department, it might be uh, through Dave or, some, or different groups. Um, so it's really, we're using existing um, um, connections, but it's someplace that we're gonna need a lot more work and a lot more support, and something we will talk about in a little bit. So, um, so the next one. Yeah, no, go back. Um, so these are some of the issues that, that we have identified um, in our, for our vulnerable communities. And I think we're not the only ones, obviously. This is people have been emailing us saying, what's going on with, um, with um, food security issues and things like that. Um, oh, can I say a yeah, bit about please, that? Go. Um, so very quickly, I'll be brief. Um, I think everyone at the at the table here has had some role in some of the steps we've been taking, but let me just quickly uh, highlight a few things that uh, have been going on to help our, our vulnerable uh, folks within our community. So I can't say enough, as Paul just did, about the schools. We're, um, you know, we're working closely with the schools and Mike Morris and his team. Um, they are coordinating food distribution to eligible families in our community. Uh, so that is ongoing, and, and uh, the schools uh, uh, did a terrific job getting that up and running quickly. Um, we're working with our senior center director, coordinating uh, and continuing uh, the food uh, distribution programs at the senior center, so that is ongoing. Um, I know that Julie and Tim and Scott, um, I, before I get to that, uh, I know that uh, uh, Chief Nelson, uh, your staff has also been uh, reaching out to uh, senior communities, uh, 
uh, at the Arbors, at Applewood, at Ann Whalen already, so thank you for that. Um, at the shelter, uh, I know the shelter staff, um, Julie and others at this table have been in close contact um, with uh, the leadership at the shelter. Um, so we're doing everything we can to support uh, that vulnerable population. Um, I know that health screenings are beginning uh, at intake now, uh, provided by uh, doctors, nurses, and uh, PAs. Uh, so I know Julie has been working on that and, and coordinating those efforts uh, with, with uh, uh, Kevin and other staff there. Um, they're, they're instituting new and more extensive cleaning procedures uh, for the shelter at the end of each uh, sheltering day. Um, they're already um, establishing social distancing of cots within the building. Um, and I know that uh, Rob Mora, our building commissioner, is working with the leadership at Craig's Doors uh, looking at some of the day use options because of course we realize that public buildings both in town and on the college campuses um, are closed. Uh, temperatures are still at a level that we have some concern. So we're looking at options for uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness uh, where they could go during the day. So that is ongoing. Um, and then lastly, our CPOs are reaching out, have already reached out to the leadership at Craig's Doors uh, to see if we can help with recruiting some volunteers. We know that uh, the shelter has lost many volunteers, uh, particularly those college students who have left our community, but there are other college students coming back to our community from schools all around the country, and there may be an opportunity for us to have them uh, assist and do some volunteering there in the evenings. So those are some of the tangible steps we've been taking, and um, I guess we'll be happy to have questions later on in the presentation. So you've been very patient. I know it's hard to listen when you're remote. Uh, just two more slides. Um, so um, some of the things we're working on is the, the things we, I, I talked about earlier, remote work, what's, what are the policies around that, committee meetings canceled and then move forward, um, ongoing communication, regular updates to the council and to the public, and um, the next slide, if you can, I'll mention this. Um, one of the things I want to sort of conclude on is that this is a global pandemic. Um, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, these are extraordinary times, and communication and support for each other is key. The decisions we are making are science-based decisions. We re depend on our subject matter experts, specifically Julie and Tim, and their connections and their relationships to all the other scientists who are looking at this to give us advice and provide the, the um, decisions that we think are in the best interest of the town. So there are two things that I'm going to conclude with. One is today at 4 o'clock I uh, declared a state of emergency I, um, that al allows us to, um, it aligns us with the decisions that were made at the federal level and the state level. It provides a clear communication to the public that we, this is an important issue and we're going to take unusual steps to continue to address it. Um, it doesn't mean anything dr draconian, um, although there are those steps that are down the road that seems that will come from different states that are happening now. Um, so that is a significant um, step for us, and that happened at 4 o'clock today, and the council has it in their inbox as well. Um, the second is we have talked a lot about town operations and how we're doing, and I think we've got that pretty much under control. But there's a bigger community out there, the whole community, and there needs to be more, and there's um, more people involved who can participate in that and support that. And I call it resilient Amherst. It can be called anything. It's just a group of uh, citizens who will come together and start to address how do we help the, we have people coming out, of, out, at, to, uh, out to us saying, how do I help my coffee shop? How do I help the business community? The person who waits on my table, I want them to um, you know, make sure that they don't lose, lose funds. Um, so the people want to set up GoFundMe pages. There'll be a lot of organic things, but we also want to provide a um, place, a channel for people to, to say, I'm here to help. I'm here, I'm willing to make phone calls for the senior center. I'm willing to, um, help find a, a space for um, people who are experiencing homelessness to be during the day. I'm, I'm willing to do all these different things that are, that are going to be needed. So that's going to be a community, going to be a community effort. effort. It's not going to be us. 
um, doing it. So, um, so we, I'll, I'll be working with the council president and have had discussions with the council president about this. Um, so um, anyway, so working with the council president to talk about the formation of this, this group. So those are the next two things until something else hits us. So I think there, there are questions and answers. We also have our state, I believe we have our state rep and state senator available. It's up to the president how you want to move forward from here. All right. Thank you, Paul, and to all of you for your just amazing work over these last several weeks, and particularly this last week. Um, so I think rather than ask questions here, I'd like to make sure that we, while we have Joe Comerford, our senator, and Mindy Dom with us, that we go ahead and ask them to speak, and then we'll take questions from the council, okay? So, um, Joe, are you ready? Senator Comerford? Hi, everybody. Yes, I've been on the line listening, and I want to thank you for your service. Um, how long would you like the update to be? I, if we could keep it to about five minutes, that would be good. One thing we're all aware okay. of is fatigue with um, using online meetings. Of course, yes. Well, I, I've been on the line for the entire meeting. I'm grateful for your service. This is an unprecedented time. I've heard it called at the State House something akin to the economic crash in 2008 plus, right? Because the plus is, of course, uh, the impact of the virus and how much we still are learning. So as folks have said, what's true in Amherst about the situation being rapidly moving, fluid, changing, uh, and it's a call for us all to be nimble and uh, both pragmatic and expansive in our thinking all at the same time, that's true at the state level. I want to say that uh, Rep. Dom is un have been doing an unbelievable job at really leveraging her public health expertise uh, from, you know, really, really at the back at the start of when this became clear that it was going to be an issue in the Commonwealth in the United States. Rep. Dom has really been leading, and I'm tremendously grateful to be in partnership with her. Uh, so at the Senate level, uh, you may remember that, uh, or you may have heard that I, as Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, I was tuned in really quickly and did move the legislature, both the, the, my committee chair, um, in public health and my own committee to a, an oversight hearing. And uh, it now seems like it was months and months ago. In fact, it was a couple of weeks ago uh, as things were really clearly um, crystallizing for us. We uh, learned a great deal there. It began informing the work of the Senate uh, and I was named to lead the Senate effort. So I'm chairing the, um, the working group uh, in the Massachusetts Senate responsible for responding. I'll tell you uh, the committees that we've uh, put together in uh, the working group. Again, this is a, uh, an attempt for us to be lean, mean, and quick uh, in our own work uh, and because we want to serve the people of the Commonwealth. So my, uh, the committee members that are leading different buckets of work are Senator Sear around elder affairs, uh, lots of, I know you're talking a lot about elder affairs. There's lots we can do in terms of advocacy and funding and policy. Senator Lewis, schools, uh, that's pre-K through higher ed. Um, Senator Brownsberger, elections, municipalities, courts, and uh, the Department of Corrections. Senator Tarr, we're looking at price chains, uh, supply chains, and price gouging. Senator Cream is interpreting federal guidance. We're getting both daily federal guidance, sometimes hourly federal guidance, and then sometimes hourly state guidance. And our job is to interpret them for people like you. Senator Friedman on healthcare and hospitals. We've been in very close contact with the, as my job here representing you with our area hospitals uh, and our health centers and providers. But we also have to think about uh, the well being of the whole and the whole surge capacity for the Commonwealth. Senator Lesser, economic recovery and reinvestment, including small businesses, workers, and nonprofits. And then I'm leading the safety net um, subcommittee, and we're looking here at food security. Uh, we're looking at uh, housing and homelessness to begin. Uh, so 
the Senate's moving on, on these areas all at once. Um, each of these subgroups has uh, numbers of senators that I've assigned to work in those subgroups. We're working on three different tiers. We're working on advocacy with the governor. Uh, so the governor and the executive branch under a state of emergency can move a great many things quickly that are within the executive's purview. So we're channeling up uh, daily, um, through daily conversations and meetings uh, and um, small leadership meetings, so meetings with folks like me talking to the governor's staff and then meetings with the Senate president where I escalate to her, um, escalating issues that we hope to see executive movement on. We're also looking at funding. So we passed a $15 million um, uh, supplemental budget. Really, honestly, that's chump change uh, compared to what we're going to need. And uh, the state knows that. Certainly, um, we're glad that our federal counterparts are moving as well. Um, so we are escalating up budget recommendations. And then finally, policy. So there are things that the legislature uh, can do uh, that, in fact, only we can do on certain issues. And so we're dug in on each of these working groups on those three areas. And uh, so you'll already see some policy and some budget recommendations from the Senate moving um, to that end. Let me just say that, um, and I think I have one more minute. Uh, I am available to constituents. We've been uh, reaching out to a range of different cohorts from the health sector to the small business sector to municipal officials. Elena Cohen from my team is district director, as some of you may know. Um, certainly, we're firing on all cylinders because we're both serving the district and then helping to lead the Senate in this work. Uh, so we're going to bring on extra capacity so that we can be um, we can staff up, and the Senate president is is going to support that. Uh, but please, my uh, my website, Senator Joe Comerford, is the place where you can get me a one stop shop. Um, my team and I are here for you and the town of Amherst. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, Joe, we're going to, I hope you can stick around with us a little bit. There may be some additional questions. And I know you and Representative Dom have been working very, very at, rapidly to file effective legislation as we go forward that helps businesses at, and communities as well. So, Representative Dom, if you could please come on. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Hello? Hi. So, um, so this is Mindy. First, I wanted to let you know that as of today, based on the Department of Public Health surveillance report, there have been 197 confirmed cases in Massachusetts. Um, they're really throughout Massachusetts, and you can find more information about it on the Department of Public Health website. It's a pretty great page. You can also check out the governor's emergency orders. It's www.mass.gov slash COVID-19. And there you can reach not only the surveillance data, the emergency orders, and the executive orders that are following it. Um, I just want to echo one thing that Senator Comerford said, which is that we are here for the residents and for the town. Um, we are actively um, kind of trying to find out what people's experiences are, not only their experiences, but their hardships, better understand them, not only to move state government to meet their needs, but also to identify where we need to have legislation to make that happen. And Senator Comerford and I, as well as other people in the Valley's delegation, we will be pooling our resources as staff also so that there's a team approach to the COVID-19 sort of casework that might come up from the communities. So I just want to say a few words about being in a time of uh, changing information and uncertainty. And we for sure are in that space. But that means that every time we learn something new, even though it kind of represents the uncertainty of before, it also means that we're stronger going forward. I want to urge folks to take care of themselves and their families, not only by social distancing, but emotionally, because uncertainty can be hard. But a colleague of mine described the practice of social distancing, particularly if people are able to stay home and work remotely and not go out as an investment in our healthcare system. Um, in that by staying home and potentially not transmitting infection, we are in fact lowering the infection rate 
and protecting our hospitals and medical providers. Um, we're also protecting the most vulnerable amongst us. Um, I want to just say that if you think you're ill, the, um, the guidance is please don't go to the doctor's office or the emergency room or your clinic. Call them first. One of the executive orders that the governor put into effect over the weekend, make sure that providers in all settings, whether it's a hospital or a private office, are able to get reimbursed for telemedicine to all patients. And COVID-19 um, related cases will have no co-pays or cost shares. So there's no reason not to call, but there is the guidance not to go in as a way of protecting the um, reception space and not exposing people to infection. Um, there will be more testing available this week in Massachusetts. We'll probably be seeing a whole lot more numbers coming up, not only in number of tests, but when we test more, we're going to find more infections. Um, we're going to be able to report more infections. And so those numbers will surely be increasing. One thing that was said earlier that I just want to correct is that the executive order did not close restaurants. That does not mean that restaurants will not want to suspend business, but it did not close restaurants. It, it banned on-site consumption, but allowed the continuation of delivery and takeout. So for those restaurants that are still open in Amherst, if people are feeling comfortable, they can still be patronized, but on a takeout or delivery basis. Um, I've been posting on social media other ways to support our local businesses, and I'm sure Senator Comerford has too. That's also a place where we're posting information. And um, again, your, the needs of the town and the needs of residents as it relates to the state and otherwise in this epidemic, and it will unfold because there'll be more healthcare related needs as we in fact experience infections. Please let us know so that we can be of assistance, whether it's connecting you to unemployment insurance and that on an expedited way, small business loans, other healthcare providers, testing, that's why we're here. Um, and in the, since Friday, four pieces of legislation have been filed um, that I know about that directly reflect the experience of people in the Valley. So um, at this point, your experience is really going to be the to-do list for the legislature as it should be. And together we'll make sure that this response is effective and timely and um, compassionate. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we already have two counselors who have done the following, and let me explain how we now work the um, technology. There is a chat area. In the chat area, you say that you would either like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, I will then make sure that I'm aware of that because Sean and Athena are helping, and I'll call on you. You unmute, unmute your um, computer, and you ask your question, make your statement, and then go back to mute. I'd like to suggest that we start with any questions that we might have of the senator or the state representative. Okay. Andy uh, Steinberg, please unmute your phone and go ahead. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody um, from our staff and the S Senator Comerford and Representative Tom for their presentations. Um, I'll be uh, really quick. There are two matters and they actually both um, end up tying back to questions for our legislators. Uh, so I appreciate being able to come on now. Um, one is that um, while my heart, because of my work in, uh, with the uh, people in my career, is with the vulnerable populations we're talking about, but I have had a lot of um, contacts um, in the last two days from small businesses, and I'm really pleased to hear that um, both of our legislators have recognized that problem. I think that we as a town also need to be very cognizant of the special problems that they are having and make sure that we are providing the flexibility and, and listening. Uh, but the question that gets more towards the legislators that I was referring 
referring to is a different subject and um, it gets into a question side. One of the problems that we have as a council, and I know this from my work on the finance committee before this and then the select board before this, is that we have a lot of deadlines that we're working with all, all the time, including the development of the budget for the um, community, approval of budgets, and we have other things that we're working with um, that involve, for example, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and the Mass School Building Authority now because of our building projects. And um, those timelines usually drive our work. And under the circumstances we're going to be in, some of those deadlines are going to be hard to achieve with the kind of response that we always like to give. Um, what thought has been given to providing some degree of flexibility for these kinds of deadlines that I'm referring to? Um, either um, Min Mindy or Joe. Hi, Joe, hey, Oh, go ahead, Rep. John. I was just going to suggest, thank you, Senator. I was going to suggest, Andy, that you put together a list of the particular deadlines that you are that you've already identified that are problematic in terms of what's going on. Um, I'll be happy to bring that to the speaker's office, which has been very receptive to, see, to understanding the demands that are on municipalities and trying to address them. In fact, last week when I met with uh, the town manager and town council president and it was brought to my attention around the issue of remote participation, but requiring physical presence of a quorum and how that could be complicated. I merely not only brought it to the speaker's office, but I, I kind of brought legislation to the speaker's office that I was going to be introducing. I don't know if it had any effect, but soon thereafter, the governor released an executive order saying that they were going to allow remote participation. So I think a lot of what they're doing is based on what they're hearing or the needs. Um, so if you're able to at least share the deadlines that you're concerned about, I can get you feedback on what's going to be expected for them. I tend to think, and I'll be honest with you, that some of them will be relaxed, um, but I don't want to say for sure which ones because I don't know how it, how it will all shake out. But I think there's an understanding that you're working under deadlines that might be hard. So are we. Today at the governor's press conference, I heard the speaker say, give some indication that it's not even clear about um, the legislature's budget deadline. So I think there's an understanding that uncertainty means that we there isn't um, definite date, but in terms of specific deadlines, I'd be more than happy to bring that back and get at least some comments and reflections that could be helpful to the town. Thank you. I believe um, that we then, will be developing that, but go ahead, uh, Senator Comfort. Sure. I was just going to echo what Rep. Dom said. It's really important to have the most clear, most proactive uh, communication from the town possible. Uh, and I just wanted to say that there, are, as I'm sure folks probably know, there are two kinds of ways these, these dates get uh, decided in law. One is through regulation where we don't need the legislature. We just need good advocacy with the executive branch to get them changed. And one is with um, the legislature. So for example, uh, the legislature, and I'm sure the house is working on this too, um, the legislature is working on some Student Opportunity Act deadlines that need to get moved. Uh, but so the Senate's working on that. So we need to move the April 1st reporting date. We need to dispatch MCAS. Uh, that needs to be done legislatively. But other dates can be moved through regulation or through executive order now that we're in a state of emergency. So escalating them up to us is essential. And in the Senate, uh, the working group that I'm running has a municipalities elections uh, subgroup, and they're all churning on dates. But again, getting visibility into what's what's hard for Amherst will be critical so that we can add that to the pot and they can move on it from the Senate side and join Rep. Dom. And that's what we did. We heard about municipality strife, and we also escalated through the Senate president to the governor, and that's the kind of bottom-up push that we'll keep doing to move the executive branch where it can move quickly. Okay. Uh, Andy, you said you had a second question. No, but, uh, there were two, and I covered them both. Thank you very much, and thank you 
both and we will follow up uh, with your suggestion to get you the list. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yes. yes. Okay, Kathy, would you please unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Lynn. And I too want to thank all the work that's gone into the staff and Mindy and Joe up in Boston. I have a, a one step higher level question, not directly just to Amherst, but to all of us. The federal tax uh, filing date and the state tax filing, tax filing date is April 15th still. I'm thinking today about all these people walking into their accountants' offices um, and what the accountants are going to be doing in terms of exposure. I don't know whether there's been any discussion about moving those dates at all. That was my question. Okay. Uh, oh. So I, I can't speak for the federal government, although we've been in touch with the federal delegation on dates that we share. Certainly in the Senate, we're looking at all dates currently. And, you know, they're all on the table. And uh, as folks have said throughout this call, there is an evolving understanding. So some people, um, some people got an understanding really quickly that we should be looking at these dates, you know, three or four weeks ago. Uh, for some, it's taken a bit longer to get to that understanding. And, um, but they're there now, both in the, the legislature and the executive. And, you know, you can count on us uh, to continue to watchdog. There, so many things. April 15th is, is one among um, likely thousands of dates that are in the, on the move right now uh, because of this. Okay, thank you. Um, the next person, Shalini, you wanna unmute your mic and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much. So these are questions actually from John Page from the Chambers of Commerce. We all received them, but I thought uh, two that were of interest to me and would might be helpful to hear from um, Senator and uh, Rep. Mindy Dome. Uh, the first one was, how do we best position the town of Amherst and the surrounding areas to receive federal and state aid as it becomes available? And another question that... Uh, is really relevant to our local businesses is what emergency funds and other sources can businesses make damage uh, damages claims to? I can start this and then um, Senator Comerford can add in, I hope. Okay. Well, first of all, today, um, I don't know if there's, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure about positioning um, Amherst for federal aid. I think we have to really be at this point making sure that we position the Commonwealth to be getting federal aid. And one of the ways I understand to do that is there's a small business loan sort of application that basically documents the impact. And I put it up on my Facebook page. I'm more than happy to share it with the town council. Small businesses who are feeling the impact from COVID-19. And that also goes for folks who are feeling the impact because the colleges and universities have closed as a result of the health crisis should be filling out that documentation because that's going to help establish impact in the Commonwealth and that will position the Commonwealth for federal aid, as I understand it. Um, the second uh, part of that is that today's press conference, the governor announced that they were starting, um, I think a $10 million interest-free loan for small businesses. And we'll be finding out more information about that and the guidance for that probably over the next I would say 24 hours. Um, small businesses should reach out to us. They should reach out to Senator Comerford's office, my office. That's why we're here and we're joining together. So I wouldn't say go to both. Um, you could go to one and you'll probably get both. Um, I don't want to tell people what not to do though. If they want to go to both, they should. Um, but we'll find out more information about that loan package. I suspect that is the first small business loan package that we'll see. It will not be the last. I think it's really geared towards this immediate sort of shock piece. And I think we're all expecting that with the federal emergency order, there'll be more money coming later on. But again, we have to be able to document the impact in Massachusetts. And we do that by small businesses filling out. It's called an application, but I don't quite think it is an application. It's more like an impact form, which um, I'll be happy to get you the link for. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Senator? Uh, Comfort. Um, 
during the call, I, I will confess that I was multitasking, and there is a, a, a thread that was started by John and Claudia and a few others. I sent the uh, summary from the governor's office out, although unfortunately the governor, thanks to Claudia, um, who flagged it, the governor sent the wrong link. So I emailed the governor's people, and they're checking on the link. Um, but I just – so that's, that's out in the world through Rep. Dom and me. It's, I think it's really important that folks understand that this is the first pretty basic foray. We still don't know the federal money that, that it's coming into Massachusetts. Um, you know, the, the House passed the federal package. The Senate hasn't taken it up at the federal level. Uh, so there'll be both state and federal money flowing, and our job as your advocates at the state level will be to channel that money uh, as effectively and as equitably uh, and as much to Western Mass as possible. Okay. If um, I can just say one other thing, one of the other pieces of legislation that we introduced was to give um, host communities, um, specifically small businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities in communities that host colleges and universities that have had to close because of COVID-19, specific um, sort of priority in a, a loan program. Who knows what will happen with that legislation, but submitting that legislation and filing it was sort of like putting a flag in the ground to say there's a unique economic impact for towns like Amherst, whose economy is really dependent on higher education in this situation for this particular time. It may be the same economic impact as other towns a week or two from now, but in the wake of college closures, I think we have a specific impact that we definitely wanted the state to be able to recognize. Okay, thank you. Evan, would you please unmute your mic? Yes, thank you. Thank you to Senator Comfort and Representative Dom for being with us. Um, so I, I, my question is um, less about the businesses and more about the employees. Um, so with the governor's announcement yesterday, uh, many low wage service industry workers uh, finding themselves without a paycheck. Uh, I know the governor, uh, also talked about some changes to unemployment insurance that he could make, some that are being filed legislatively. But I'm sort of wondering just what the options are um, for the many people here uh, who just lost all of their hours in the restaurant uh, over the next several weeks. And then also if anything's being worked on with regard to uh, helping these folks pay rent, perhaps uh, rent relief, rent deferment. Do you want to start Senator with Cumberford? Yep, go ahead. Yep. Um, you want me to start, Rep. John? Sure, that's fine. Okay, I, I'm happy to go, but you go ahead. Oh, I know you have well, to go. you go. You, no, you go, and then I'll go, and then I'll say goodbye to everybody. Okay. Well, as thank you. As you know, um, Evan, the governor did create this unemployment insurance. He's waived the one-week waiting period. I think it's all about getting um, unemployment insurance out to people quickly. Um, you know, the closings came. The the public health emergency sort of came on very strong, and so people were caught off awares. Um, I can't tell you for sure that there'll be extra emergency assistance funds available. I know that there were organizations like the Community Foundation of Western Mass who are trying to leverage the philanthropic and uh, generous spirit of the Valley and then be able to provide those funds directly to organizations, which then may in turn provide emergency assistance to individuals. Um, at this point, there's legislation I believe in that would put a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Again, none of this legislation has been moved. It's all about legislators saying this is our intention. Um, I would think that if people were facing eviction or foreclosure, um, I certainly would want to know about that. I think the town might want to know about that because we might want to have a conversation around those issues. Um, I think that's all I have to say. But you're right, in terms of people who may this week have lost their paycheck, I'm not, I, I know that I don't think there are any cash assistance sort of being provided to people, but I think that there are organizations that are providing support in terms of basic needs. Senator Comerford, um, and I'll just, I'll just chime word? in super quickly um, uh, and say that um, the Senate Working Group uh, is has a subcommittee on two subcommittees that are relevant to your question. Um, one is the economic development one that I mentioned, chaired by Senator Lesser. So he, he is looking at the pieces of 
unemployment insurance that are not covered in Governor Baker's relaxing of some regulations, which are really important. His executive order was important for us. Uh, there's more we can do. He's also looking at um, sick banks and leave policies that don't burden small businesses. Um, and finally, um, in my safety net uh, committee, um, building off of what Rep. Dom said, we are going to look at loan, um, uh, sorry, evictions and foreclosures. Uh, the House did that first. Um, the Senate is going to pull it over. Uh, and we're doing a bunch on food security. Food security will look quick, quickly like more money, but it doesn't only have to be more money. It can be things like uh, EBT cards that get um, more flexibility. Say, for example, EBT allowing for people to get home delivery, which is not now allowed. Um, we can't get delivered foods with our EBT programs. We're also looking at basic minimum income. You know, many people have said that our systems are frozen. Uh, we're trying to, hard to figure out how to work virtually in some sectors. Uh, all of these things are going to mean that it's going to take too long for us to respond for real people who, as you say, have lost these wages overnight. So we should just infuse um, a check from the government for some amount based on some criteria like earned income tax credit eligibility or something like that. Uh, I'm in favor of that, and um, that's being moved uh, also uh, in the legislature. And um, and I want to just I want to go back to what Rep. Dom said about the host community, which is important for a, a community like Amherst, um, especially like Amherst. Uh, Rep. Dom is leading that in the legislature, uh, and we just escalated it up to Senator Lewis. Um, so it's really a, it's an important initiative and. I'll certainly, I'm certainly going to go all in, but I just want to make sure that folks know that Rep. Dom is raising that issue um, at the forefront. And with that, yeah. I'm unfortunately having to go to another meeting, um, but I wish everybody well. I'm happy to be in touch with anybody um, who would like to schedule time to speak and connect. And thanks for your service. And we want to thank you thank for you so much. joining us. A okay. pleasure. Okay, good night, thank everybody. You, um, so I'd like to move to questions to the town. Uh, if we could, and uh, plus one four one three five five nine one six four nine is now exiting. Okay, and we have a question from Dorothy. Is now exiting. Dorothy, would okay. you please can, unmute? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I did have a question originally for her to do with food stamps further down the line, but then I'll ask the questions I have for the town. Um, one is um, uh, Paul mentioned a group of uh, citizens who wanted to um, help out in many ways. And I thought that one of the things that we as counselors could do rather easily is um, using our precinct lines um, and then within our precincts get block captains, uh, form more detailed email lists of the people within our districts. Uh, for example, um, we already have kind of one in, in precinct 10, but there's a lot of people's email addresses I don't have. That way we could, um, with block captains, have a way of keep getting in contact and not collecting information that people don't want to share, but collecting the information they do want to share, such as if they uh, live alone, um, who might be emergency contact, so that we could keep track of people if things get really bad. Um, so um, I, I know that there are email addresses that one can buy. Um, I do not have them. I think they're expensive. I just have like a, a what I could get. Um, I believe that at some point, uh, some, some group in town actually did have such email addresses or maybe the town could buy them so that the town, um, so that we counselors could have a better way of keeping closer contact with the people in our districts and letting them have closer contact with us. So that if somebody is alone or somebody needs help, they could communicate through us and we could get it to the to the town very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, is there, I guess I see another question from Darcy. Would you please unmute and ask your question? Darcy, you need to make sure you unmute. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Um, I have a, a couple of things. One is that um, I really uh, do like the idea of the um, 
uh, organizing some kind of group like Resilient Amherst. And I think that there are already um, some community district based organizations that are in existence that might be willing to work together to um, to help out with that. I've been hearing a lot from constituents um, about how they can help, how, how they can help the business community, how they can help people who are in need. Um, and I think that that would be really good. I think that we probably have a lot of participation as far as more residents watching this particular meeting than we usually have. And, you know, I'm kind of sad that we don't have public comment at this meeting. Um, and am thinking that maybe we need to, to schedule a meeting that might be um, entirely public comment so that we can, because I think people have a lot of ideas about um, how they can be helpful is what I'm sensing. I'm, I've heard a lot more from constituents in the last week than I have in the last year. Um, so I think to the extent that we can do that, that would be really helpful and make sure that we communicate with them. We did, I did get one comment from a constituent that, um, that the, the website, the COVID-19 part of our website didn't actually advertise this meeting. Um, maybe that was wrong, but um, I, I think that, that um, a lot of people didn't know that this meeting was happening today, uh, even though we all send it out on social media and so on. Um, so, um, and the second thing is that I would, I would really like it if we could um, use Zoom and have Zoom meetings for our, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can get our, our uh, different meetings going again after some of this settles down and, and use Zoom, which is, I think a little bit more accessible for the public to use. It's very easy and, you know, it would be a way for the public to just be able to click on a link and um, be able to, to participate in a moderated meeting where, you know, it could be organized so that it wasn't chaotic. Um, so yeah, to the extent that we can have the, you know, get help from our public, I think that would be really, really good. Okay, I'm and gonna Paul. pause for a moment and ask uh, Paul Bachelman to speak. So two quick answers. Thanks, Darcy, for bringing those up. One is uh, we're using Teams for this one. We will evaluate that. IT will look at it and they'll investigate Zoom also. So I think I hear a lot of people are familiar with Zoom and it's, it's pretty user-friendly. So we'll look at what the pluses and minuses are. Um, so we went this way with this one and we'll evaluate. Secondly, um, the video for this um, this meeting, we will put it on our website, and that's a great idea to put it on the um, the Department of Health's um, website as well, because it's it's all about the um, coronavirus. So thank you for that suggestion. We'll do that. Okay, um, Shalini, I'm going to skip you for a moment and give Alyssa a chance to ask a question. Alyssa, unmute unmute your mic. I did, but I wasn't ready yet because I thought Shalini was going first. Um, I actually do have a couple of comments associated with all this enthusiasm that people have to be helpful. And as I feel confident that the people that you have in that room there are actually already looking at trying to bring together, you know, just the SALT group that was seniors that worked with the fire department still meet and how can they be helpful? There was an emergency response group that I think a lot of us who knew Kay Moran knew that she was affiliated with, how they might be helpful. Um, there's a new seniors group, one of these uh, senior community groups that one started in Northampton, one started over here. Of course, with all these things, these people would need to be managed. And I will speak as someone who has an 87 year old living with me. If I lived out of town and I was concerned about my 87 year old mother-in-law living here, I don't want just a helpful person knocking on her door because that person could be asymptomatic and be sick. So. I think we have to figure out, and it sounds like the CPOs are already doing a great job, and maybe we can just continue to be fed information on how those connections are working. Because this is not a matter of, oh, it snowed a lot, let's have someone go plow your driveway. This is a, with social distancing, it's this really unique thing. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, Shalini, you had another question. Yes, so this was a question for Julie, I think. Um, there are actually three questions. Do you want me to say all three in one go? Go ahead. Okay, so the first one is just generally, I think residents are still confused about what's the protocol if someone feels the, system, uh, the symptoms, like basic plans for family or households who may have infected members. So I don't know if that's up on that website. I have to go and check. The second question was about how do we reach people who don't have internet and how do we keep them informed? And then the third question was uh, something that's been coming up, how can residents help the local restaurants? And we've been talking in District 5 and with Darcy and then I'm talking with BID and Chambers. And so while we want to promote the pickup and deliveries, uh, in local businesses, we also want to make sure that they are safe. So have there been special guidelines, safety guidelines for restaurants under the current conditions? Have those been sent out? Julie? Thank you, on. Shalini. Uh, that mm -hmm. was a lot. So I think I'm going to start <laughs> with your last one because okay. that's... That's the most uh, resonating in my brain. So thank you for the question about food and restaurants. So first of all, um, the question that I think, a part of what that question is, how, what's happening in restaurants to make sure they're really safe and healthy? And um, the FDA is actually supposed to come out with a statement tomorrow. Uh, what we're hearing is that statement is going to say what we've already been doing, which is that if restaurants use the cleaners they're supposed to and adhere to all of the sanitary conditions that are normally in the food code, then our restaurants are completely safe. So our health inspector has been going out and on her routine inspections, she has been advising managers and owners about that, that it's really important to be doing everything that is stated in the food code to keep restaurants sanitary and clean. She's also developing something that's going to go out via email. We have most of our, our owners available by email, so an email will be going out just reiterating all of that and also really emphasizing hand washing. Of course, in a food establishment, everyone is supposed to be doing that anyway. So this is just reinforcing everything that needs to be happening. So that was the part about are our restaurants safe and is takeout all right? You had another piece there, which is about what are we gonna do to help our restaurants? I think that's already been discussed a little bit and I think that's part of what um, when Paul is mentioning this concept of having some subgroups that could be part of something that keeps Amherst resilient, is having folks working on that issue. Because we do understand if, and have been very concerned from the beginning about the impact on, on all the folks who work in restaurants. Now, does that answer what you wanted to know about question three? Okay, so I'm going to go back to question one, which I believe I'm going to restate that to make sure I've got it all. So you're asking me that perhaps people are still confused about what they should do if they have someone who's sick. Okay, so the first thing to remember is that if you're sick at home and you have flu-like symptoms, which include a fever, and some respiratory distress, then what you're gonna do, as you always should, you're not going to work. You're gonna call your primary care provider. People should not go to urgent cares or show up at the emergency room. The first step is to call your primary care provider where they're gonna go over with you what your symptoms are. It has been a very bad flu year, so we've seen flu A, flu B. We've also seen some other really severe viruses going around, so people have been sick a lot this year. If a, pr a primary care provider thinks that perhaps you have symptoms of COVID-19, very likely you're gonna be told to stay home and care for yourself at home. People who are severely ill are going to be advised how they should come into a doctor's office 
or how they should get transported to the hospital for that kind of care. We do know that testing is going to open up really quickly, but until it does, rather than people going to healthcare providers for testing, they're going to be told to stay at home. Many, we're not exactly sure the percentage, but many of the cases of illness that will happen will just be mild to moderate, and people will be able to stay home and recover just like they would from the flu. The difference will be if someone is asked to stay home who has symptoms, they're being isolated, which means they should stay in their home, stay in their own bedroom. If, the, if they have the capability, they should have their own bathroom. If they don't have that capability, then they should be cleaning that bathroom or someone else should be cleaning it with gloves with the appropriate 10% uh, Ten percent bleach solution or wipes if they have them available or Lysol, and that person should be staying in their room and not having contact with others. That should go on for seven days. At the end of, if before seven days or at, at the, so for a minimum of seven days, then the person during this time should be mom monitoring their temperature. If their temperature is gone for three complete days, 72 hours, without a fever reducer, and they have no other symptoms, then they can be checking with their healthcare provider about being able to leave the home. We w now, this is what's true as of today. Things are changing daily. We will be seeing more testing. We'll be seeing more testing sites. Luckily, warmer weather is coming because it it could be that testing is going to happen in some unusual settings. There are, There is the possibility of doing drive-up tests for people where they won't get out of their car. There'll be the possibility of having outdoor testing. None of that is in place yet. Okay. Is there more that I can add to that? No. I think you should proceed. Okay, and your yeah. second question I have now sorry. lost. The third was the internet. Uh, sorry, people who oh. don't have internet, yes. and how, can we, how are we reaching out to them? Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. So one of the ways we will be reaching out to folks is through various types of community ambassadors. So one, an example of that is we have something called the Amherst Human Service Network in Amherst. This is an email list serve of about 60, 62 service providers who, provide, who are either heads of agencies or work for agencies that work with folks. They've already gotten one message. Um, so we'll be disseminating written material in different languages out that way. Um, and other ways will be possibly through faith community. Well, no, sorry, I'm gonna change that because our, um, most of our, a lot of our faith communities are closed now. So we're aware of the need for people who don't have internet and people who speak different languages. We will be looking at unusual ways to get that information out. Another way will be we have all the um, addresses for all the apartment complexes. We'll be do, doing mailings out to apartment complexes. Okay. Uh, Dorothy, you have a question at this time. Okay, I've just unmuted. Well, earlier I uh, emailed in with a suggestion that we take uh, an empty town building and prepare it uh, in advance of need uh, as an emergency <clears throat> as emergency hospital beds. But since then, I have thought of an easier way, which is um, using UMass, which is a state institution. Um, <clears throat> now, I may be wrong on this, but I, I, I know there's some buildings that they plan to knock down and replace. Uh, if those buildings now are emptied, which I think they are, the um, maybe perhaps the Lincoln Apartments um, or maybe some of the ones on North Pleasant or East Pleasant, uh, that space or even an empty dorm could be prepared as uh, backup emergency hospital beds for those people who need emergency care with ventilators, should we come to that. Um, and then th those buildings are slated to be uh, destroyed in the future 
then no one would have to say, oh, I've just got assigned to the, um, you know, the plague dorm. Um, I think that we could, we should do that because if we wait till we know that we need those beds, as you know, to, we'd be if if things get here as bad as they are in Italy, then there won't be time to do it. So I'm I'm saying let's take the big leap and use a state facility, uh, which uh, the state should support and prepare some extra beds for those who are really who must be in a hospital. Julie and Tim, I guess, are going to respond to this. Go ahead, Julie. Thank you so much for that question. So this refers back to something that um, the chair said at the very beginning, which is that there has been preparation for the possibility of pandemic disease, epidemic disease for at least 17, 20 years, and really beyond that, but especially intensively since we saw the anthrax events after 9-11. So this type of planning, which we call surge planning, is happening among many entities. We have a 94-town um, coalition that is the Health and Medical Coordinating Coalition. So they're sort of that big, broad entity that is looking at what are going to be the needs for supplies, what are the, going to be the needs in a larger area than just a town for taking care of people, should we have that type of overwhelm at our hospitals. I also want to go back to the fact that one of the reasons to be doing what we're doing in this town, in this state, and much of the country is so we can flatten out that curve so that we can prevent having that kind of surge on hospitals because we as a town would not, for example, be able to get ventilators. We, don't, we want to prevent that from happening. We're learning from each country that's already gone through this with their specific types of medical services, their public health infrastructure, their governments, and their cultures. So the U.S., Massachusetts, Amherst, we're, we are in a good position to not have to do that. That being said, we have always had conversations about what buildings or entities might be able to help. Um, and so I really appreciate your thinking in that direction. Um, we don't feel as an emergency team, as we've had this discussion, that we need to, at this moment, be looking at empty buildings, but certainly those type of worst case scenarios have been talked about for quite some time. Thank you. Um, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, please, Julie. I'm so sorry. I wanted to say one more thing, which is that the first thing, the first thing that we're going to do is anyone who is not who has who doesn't need to should stay in the home they already have because what the majority of people are going to need is is a bed, a bathroom, a sink to wash their hands. Most people are not going to be needing to have intensive care that you're talking about that we would then set up in buildings. So I wanted to emphasize that, that we're talking about people staying home and getting their care in their home. Obviously, people who need skilled nursing and machines, it's something different. But that will not be the majority of people. OK. Uh, Evan, you have a question, please. Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. One should be quick, um, and then the other maybe not so quick uh, for Dave and for Paul. So the first question, which I think is for Dave, um, is there was a mention in talking about the shelter about they're applying social distancing to their cots. Um, and I'm sort of just curious if that's if and how much that's reducing the shelter's capacity to take in people. Um, and then the, the other questions are for more for Paul. It was mentioned very early on uh, the potential loss of water and sewer, uh, parking, uh, local option, meals tax, um, all of that. And, and given that the budget is due in a month and a half and this likely won't be over by then, I'm just sort of wondering, is there an effort to make projections 
for the fiscal year 2020 budget as it's being developed and where this might go, or is it really just anyone's guess at this point? Paul. Oh, David. So thanks for your questions, Evan. Um, on the shelter, so at this time, they are instituting uh, social distancing for the cots, and it has not reduced um, the capacity of the shelter, uh, even one bed. So they are still at the same capacity. Um, they're being creative. They're, they're still adhering to all the safety uh, requirements of our building commissioner, but um, uh, I will have Rob Mora continue to communicate with them and, and visit the shelter in the days and weeks ahead. Um, and, and again, the communication between the shelter staff and, and the fire department and the police department has been excellent uh, all along, and I'm sure we'll continue to be vigilant about that. But the short answer is no reduction in beds. Okay. Paul? So, yeah, so today was the first day, I think, that we really noticed a downturn in the number of parking, you know, parking downtown. downtown. Um, we don't know the impact. We don't have any you know, numbers coming in yet. We probably won't know till the end of May until we get a month's worth of, of uh, revenue. Um, it's just up in the air. Um, we are sort of moving forward and we, you know, talk with the schools and libraries. Um, we can adjust our deadlines a little bit in terms of if they submit their by April 1st, but I think we're gonna move forward as, um, with some cognizance of what the condition of the economy is going to be and we might adjust our projections that way. Honestly, we haven't, I haven't spent a whole lot of time on that yet. I mean, Sonia has already been focused on it, but I have not. Okay. Um, are there any other questions of the council at this time? Because Mandy Jo and I would like to ba basically just uh, make sure that there's an opportunity for counselors to ask questions about kind of their job of being a counselor. Uh, and let me just kick that off by saying, uh, we have already asked you to cancel your district meetings. Um, we probably have to say we strongly advise that you not do office hours unless you can figure out how to do them in a way that makes you and whoever comes to your office hours safe Obviously, you cannot do that in any public buildings because they're not open. Um, we are planning to go ahead next week with our uh, regular meeting. Uh, I will poll the council to see if they're willing to meet earlier since we all seem to be a little more confined to our homes. Um, but we are also going to be looking at the agenda and figuring out how to shorten the agenda, how to make sure that whatever can be put on the consent agenda is done that way and delay uh, action on other items that are not as pressing as they need be. The other thing that I've already done is contacted each of the present chairs of the four, five committees, um, four committees actually, and, uh, and plus JCPC, so five committees. And I've asked them to really prioritize what they see as the most pressing issues, the time frame for those. You know, for example, JCPC, who's advisory to the town pre town manager, um, is not going to meet this week um, and probably not immediately, but we want to make sure that they do meet in time to be able to hear from the various town departments and work with Sonia on the final advice to the town manager. Uh, Andy, Chair, Andy uh, Steinberg has clearly indicated we have to stay on target with our budget. Uh, we do not have the burden, if you will, of trying to call a town meeting, uh, which many of the towns around us are grappling with how to do that, um, how to get 100 people in some kind of semblance of order. So the reality is that, um, but we will continue to meet virtually. We will not be meeting in person if you saw the room right now, you'd realize that we're about as far away from each other as we can be and still be in the same room. So, Mandy Jo, do you have other things you want to add to that at this point? Okay. Let me ask Mandy Jo to come in first and then yeah. Darcy. Okay. No, I don't think so. Um, I think when you covered what we've discussed in, in this changing environment, 
how much of it's out of date, out of date already. But I, I would encourage, though, if you have the ability to do something like Facebook Live or some sort of social media office hours um, that might replace something, maybe that can happen. Um, you know, or a district, not a formal district meeting or something like that, but some sort of ability to or maintenance of communication back and forth between constituents in a way that keeps us remote. Okay, it appears I skipped Darcy for a question earlier. So Darcy, do you want to come back on the line? I I just had a quick question for Julie. Um, it sounds like um, what you were saying before is that there are no like um, further uh, protocols for food handling uh, other than the basic ones that that um, restaurants and and food stores are supposed to use. And I'm just wondering, are there protocols um, for for delivery and pickup and and also now we have we're having a number of different stores that are talking about doing deliveries that aren't food stores like bookstores um, you know neighbors are talking about organizing to to purchase books from Amherst books and so do they need to have any protocols for delivery uh, to our homes Julie Thank you. That's a very good question. And that actually came up on the CDC conference call today. I found it fascinating that they were talking about things like Grubhub. Um, so at this time, there are no particular protocols in place. People are thinking about that, you know, plastic bags, um, in terms of just general delivery, like even books and, and that type of thing. But in terms of food, um, no, there really isn't. And I was thinking it might be helpful for me to give a little bit more information about food. So um, this, this virus, as I said before, is really transmitted through uh, receptors that are mostly in the nose and in the lungs. And so it, food, there, there are almost none of them in the es esophagus. So as food would go down through the mouth and into the stomach, and in the stomach there are none, um, they're just finding there's, there's appears to be no route for transmission in that way. Um, the other thing too, and some of you will find this gross, but when we're talking about foodborne illnesses, we're often talking about the fecal oral route. So what that means is after food handlers use the bathroom, if they don't wash their hands well, that there are certain diseases that can be transmitted through food in that way. And again, so far the, re the research is showing that that's pretty unlikely. So they, again, they were talking about that just this afternoon on the CDC conference call. Um, and it's pretty interesting because of course the science, we keep learning more. Uh, but that's where we're at right now. So some of it comes down to, are there concerns about people handling plastic bags? Um, at this time, nothing has particularly been identified. Another good thing for people to realize is that this virus, and Jennifer Brown, our public health nurse, loves to describe it this way, it's, it's like a little sphere, you know, you've seen pictures of it, right? So, and it's not alive, it's dead. And so it starts, so it's not moving around like a bacteria is. So when it's out in sunlight and it gets UV rays from the sun, it, the walls of this little non-movable thing start to degrade. And so it starts to become... Um, no longer able to transmit disease. Now, what we don't know is how long it lasts on surfaces, but we do know that sunlight helps to degrade it. So that will all be part, perhaps, of how we're thinking about these deliveries, because, of course, deliveries will not really happen person to person. They'll be left outside people's doors. Okay. Thank you. We hear Thank new you. information each time. Um, 
Uh, Shalini, was there anything else on that one? Okay, then Alyssa, I believe you're next. Thank you. I was originally going to talk about our regular meeting next Monday, but since Julie's still there, um, I was wondering if she could remind us as we're telling people, I know what it says on the website, but like, you know, the little elevator speech about the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, just because someone's asymptomatic doesn't mean they're not sick and just don't know it yet. So I am seeing too many things out in the larger world that are saying, yeah, let's just get together. It's fine if two couples get together for dinner, but not four couples. It's like, what are you even talking about? You have no idea if folks are sick or not. Isn't that not part of what we're doing at this point? Thanks, Alyssa. That's that's a really good question. So, so one piece of, so yes, essentially we're doing social distancing, six feet. Now, when you've got a family, we're not saying everybody's, you know, six feet around a giant piece of plywood at dinner time because we have to be so far from each other because we're going to be having routine contact. But the, the, the question there about folks who are asymptomatic, and again, that came up today, um, is that we're still really learning the role of asymptomatic folks in transmission of this disease. So mostly what we're looking at is that if you're not actively coughing and sneezing, you're not transmitting anything because again, those heavy droplets aren't being spewed out. So I think one of the big things we're looking at is coughing and sneezing. Um, on the other hand, we are starting to, they are starting to see that there does appear to be sort of this pre-symptomatic stage in asymptomatic people where they could be transmitting the disease, but they don't know enough about that yet. So when we're talking about how people should change their behavior, basically they're saying social distancing, so not being together. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, if it means that two couples who are asymptomatic that don't actually live in the same house should not have dinner together. Yes. Mm, I, th I think that's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, and the chief is telling me, yes, that's what I'm saying. I just hate to say it, but yes. Alyssa, you sa said that you had some out something else to comment on. Oh, just in regards, since I know it came up earlier with someone talking about wanting to have public comment as soon as possible, and it's all well and good if we want to have, you know, some separate meeting associated with that. There's so much material available online. Of course, not everyone sees online. But um, in terms of our meeting Monday, I'm hoping we're calling it a special meeting as well so that we're not trying to manage public comment. We've had enough fun trying to manage this tonight, and I would rather not do that on Monday. Uh, let me just say that we're not going to work public comment in, in, in until we have come up with a decent way to manage that with the technology. And I'm looking at Sean while I say that and he's nodding yes. So uh, it's important that not only that we have public comment at least at one meeting a month, if not more, but that we continue to stay in touch with the public. But in addition to that, when the public comment happens, it's important that it's done in a way that the public feels that they have been heard. So, um, Andy, I believe you were next. Andy? Sorry, it took me a moment to get to my unmute button. Um, I just wanted to um, respond to something that Evan had raised a little while ago, and uh, it relates back to the question that I posed to um, Senator Comerford and Representative Dom when they were with us. The um, problem that we have with the budget is that we are really driven in the budget by deadlines, both on the regional school budget and on the um, town budget itself. Some of the deadlines come from our own charter, which was uh, devised to coincide with what the state budget policy is for when uh, we need to act to adopt the budget. And uh, we really need to have a better understanding of whether flexibility is available to us 
and how we get to that flexibility because I think it's going to be very hard on our staff to assemble the information which uh, Evan was talking about, and I corresponded with Paul earlier today about that same information, uh, what adjustments we may have to make either on the expense side or the revenue side because of what's happening. Uh, so it is a complex process. I don't think it's a subject for discussion today, but I did want to at least t um, assure the rest of you that it is recognized and that I have been corresponding a little bit about it. And I want to, through Paul and uh, Lynn, follow up with the invitation to inquire with the uh, senator and representative on what we could do. If there's a feeling that um, this needs more exploration at a meeting, I would encourage you to talk to uh, Lynn and uh, Mandy about making sure that it gets done an agenda at an appropriate point. But okay, that was me. my comment. Um, this, is, this is Rep. Mindy Dom. Hi, Andy. I'm still on the phone, actually. Joe has. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still here. No, that's okay. I, but I'm going to do, though, as a result of this phone call, I'm going to bring back the issue without the specifics of municipal deadlines across the board. The ones that Amherst faced are very similar to the ones that other towns face. And I just want to, I'm going to get some feedback, hopefully tomorrow, to at least provide some initial thoughts on what people are thinking about in terms of municipal deadlines, committees, budgets, et cetera. So that, I'll bring that back immediately, even without a specific list, so that you can, we can at least find out. And I'll also check with colleagues to see what their towns are feeling and thinking about doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe Shalini is next. Yeah, I just had a quick uh, comment about public participation. Maybe, you know, I think as district councilors, we could be collecting the questions from our residents and compiling them and bringing them to our meetings. Is that something we want to consider? We're actually looking at a couple of different ways, and we'll put that in the list of possibilities. Thank you. Um, Dorothy. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, I would like very much to have a worded piece of information that I could include to send out in an email message to those email addresses that I have of exactly how people can tune into the meeting uh, next week. Um, is it just going to be the link to go to go to channel 17 or is there anything else that they would need to know? Just uh, just so that whatever I tell them, it's correct. Okay. We'll make sure that we have that and that we send it out way in advance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? Uh, Darcy. I just have um, um, just one more comment to make about the, the possibility of including the public in our next meeting. And that is that um, this, um, this uh, format that we're using called Teams uh, apparently can accommodate up to 250 people in a meeting and, and can be moderated so that uh, it would be managed the same way that we just managed our own contributions um, so that if we had a part of the meeting that was public comment, it could just be carried on the way we, we always have public comment. Um, so I am just you know, advocating for that. I actually like Zoom better, but I guess Teams has the capacity to do it too. So I, you know, whatever we can do to make sure that we include the public, I think is really important. Thank you. We we really are working on it. And I am I feel very strongly about this as do you, whether we can make it by the next meeting, I doubt it, but we will see what we can do and urge all of you to continue to be in touch with your counselors. We really are going to skip, um, we have no action items. Uh, we also have no appointments at this point. With regard to committees, uh, is there anybody that feels a pressing need to give a committee report? Let us know. Seeing none. Um, we have no minutes to approve. Uh, Paul, I think you probably spent most of, 
uh, the early part of the meeting giving your comments. Are there any final comments from the council? Okay, then uh, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank the town manager and the team. Uh, this has been an amazing effort. I probably have been watching it unfold day by day, but not living it like you have. And uh, it gives me as a citizen, a resident of Amherst, a great deal of comfort to know that we have such a well-educated team and thoughtful team uh, working on our behalf. So thank you. I also want to make sure that we thank the people behind the scenes, uh, Athena, our, town, our clerk of the council, Sean and the whole IT department, and the various other people, our partic community participation officers who were here on Saturday answering phones and talking to the people from the schools who were concerned about the case with the regional schools. Um, finally, I want to just thank all our counselors. Um, you've worked hard to get your own lives in order and settled, I hope they are, and then immediately making yourselves available as counselors to the rest of the citizens of, the, of Amherst. And that's the job we were elected to, and I want to thank you for uh, living up to that job as well. Uh, so be safe and be well. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Maybe yes. I hear. Here. Uh, yes, we can all unmute for unknown that Unknown participant okay. is now exiting. I, we're all adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Be safe.